All right, uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining me in the, uh, in the house that Bed Angel built. Um, really appreciate your time. With um, the sporting calendar, what, what uh, piques your interest there? And um, jumping ahead, uh, the Australian Open is coming up. Um, do you have any interest with that? I do, yeah. The, um, usually what happens for me, uh, the, the last big event of the year is the ATP Tour Finals, which take place in London um, in November. And then it all goes quiet. So during that quiet period through November and December, I frantically update all of the spreadsheets, the stats and everything I gathered from the prior year. And the Australian Open is the first opportunity uh, to put those to use and have a look and see if I've learned anything from, from the prior year. Again, the time difference is a, a bit of a problem um, because if you get a tennis match that's maybe three, four hours long, um, and you just happen to pick the wrong one. You've wasted your time. So that, that can be a bit of a pain. But the Australian Open for me is the thing that kickstarts the whole of the tennis season. And uh, I begin to put into use stuff that I learned from the prior year. So the big, the, the four major tennis tournaments and then um, the next tier below that, um, I'm guessing with the liquidity being um, so large, gets your interest. What other sporting events get your interest? I will do any of the big, so we've got Euro 2020, uh, the, the big soccer tournament that's taking place this year. Um, so that's going to be a big area of focus this year. Um, but also I do, I do golf. I, this is one of the weird quirks of everywhere that I came from. Um, the very, very first bet that I ever placed on a betting exchange was on a golf market, curiously. It was the US Open, I think it was, uh, all, that, all that time way back then. Um, but yeah, I have a little thing for golf. I always do the golf majors. So I tend to go where liquidity goes. And as I've got a bigger and better over a large number of years, the smaller events tend to sort of disappear. But for example, as you said, on tennis, you've got the, the, the Grand Slam, then you've got the, um, the Masters series uh, that I'll always get actively involved in. And then all of the big stuff that happens in and around that. So yeah, racing, football, um, stroke soccer, uh, tennis, golf, uh, but I'll, I'll dip my hand into any market where there's decent liquidity. So I'll often do um, celebrity um, uh, TV shows and stuff if I think there's an opportunity there or if the Olympics comes around, then there may be an opportunity there. I hope the uh, Tokyo is looking nice and flush on the exchange. So it'll be a challenge for a uh, marketing team here and, and in the UK. Um, just in terms of um, cricket, do you do anything with cricket? The, the Big Bash is, is enormous down here and the T20 volumes are, are, are pretty large. Does that pique your curiosity? Yeah, it's a, well, the interesting thing about cricket is I really should be doing a lot more on cricket, and um, but I don't do as much as I probably should do, but that's simply because I'm so busy on everything else. So um, I, because the Cricket World Cup uh, was in the UK uh, last summer, or in England, I should say, um, that obviously I, I got quite heavily involved in that because um, it was an opportunity for me to really upskill and learn a lot about T20 and stuff. Um, but it's, it's curious in that um, I know it's a big market and it's one that everybody should be interested in, especially, you know, in Australia. But um, it's a market that I generally haven't done a huge amount on simply because my hands have been tied on all of the other sports. The sort of problem that I have is I'll generally work in the summer from about two until about sort of 10 o'clock. And that, that window sort of lengthens a bit depending upon other events that are going on. And to try and shoehorn another sport into there is, is really hard to do. But when you look at the amount of volume that cricket is doing, inevitably, you know, there is an opportunity there. So I spent a lot of last year um, getting myself up to speed on the sort of strategies that I'd likely um, deploy on cricket. And I did a lot of that during the Cricket World Cup. And I have been looking at the big bash as well and uh, messing around on there. But it's interesting because you tend to find different sports exhibit similar characteristics. So everybody's familiar with tennis, for example, and tennis trading can be explained quite well. But in fact, the metrics that you use on tennis work really well in darts. And I know that sounds odd, especially um, because darts isn't a particularly popular worldwide sport, but exactly the same things and the same trading styles can be applied to both of them. So um, just give me, give me some insight there on the strategy of, of learning those, those basic principles of the sports. If I wanted to deep dive into tennis trading, where do you recommend I start? 
Well, I think if you if you have knowledge of a sport, it can be helpful as long as it's not um, uh, because one of the things you have to avoid when you're actively trading is inserting too much bias into what you do. So I support a soccer team, um, but I won't trade them because all of a sudden your trade becomes a bit of hope, and you know they're one nil or two nil down, and you're sort of thinking, oh, they they, they could still win this, um, and that's when all of your trading falls into a great big hole. So it's useful to have knowledge of a sport, but you have to eliminate those biases. But if you're looking at tennis, for example, um, if a tennis player starts at a certain uh, price, um, then you would expect their price to reflect the underlying characteristics that are taking place within the match. But very often you'll find the market sort of goes too far in one direction. And as a consequence, you can um, take advantage of the opportunity to overcome that. But if, if you look inside Bet Angel, we have a, a tool called Tennis Trader, and you can actually model a match. So you can actually go in and enter the variables to do with the number of points they win on serve, and that will tell you what odds it thinks the match should be. So if you want to either do an outright bet or take a position, um, that is a tool that will allow you specifically to actually figure out in advance where the market's likely to go given certain score lines. Just specifically on that, say a tennis player, uh, I, I assume the women's would be quite interesting with this, but say someone's $1.50 um, and they start strongly, you, you might see an opportunity where that price crunches too far down and you sort of have in mind, hey, this person was $1.50, um, that the, the, the market's overreacted here and, and you're going to play by laying at the $1. twenty stuff like that. Yeah, and that's more or less what you do. You're looking for like a window of opportunity when you're trading. So if you're doing the Melbourne Cup, you, you look at the favorite at the Melbourne Cup and you sort of say, this is the, the, the price, it's $5. Um, the market obviously likes it, so I think it's coming down to $4.50. And, um, and therefore you take your position on that basis. But you would also say, if the price starts to move out, then I'm, I'm cutting my position because I've obviously got it wrong and I need to abandon that position. And in tennis, you would sort of go along the lines of saying, you know, this player looks far too short. I, you know, if they get broken within the next five games or in this particular set, then the price is going to move up to this level. And yet I've only got about this amount of downside uh, within the trade. So you're sort of saying, you know, I reckon I've got this about right. But even if I fail, my loss is relatively small. Yeah, right. So th that's a, a strong principle of yours is just knowing the downside. So knowing that if, if the favorite in the market continues performing so well, they're only going to move incrementally. Whereas if the momentum changes, that's going to have a significant um, change on the market and the upside is significantly greater than the downside. Very much so. And you look at a, a young player that's going to be on the tour this year and he's up against Rafa Nadal, who's getting a bit old. Um, you know, the young gun will come out and play his heart out in that first set in an attempt to try and upset the odds or to make his opponent feel uncomfortable. And even if they start at very, very short odds, you know, if they can't break down this much younger opponent um, fairly quickly, then the odds will start shifting in the market almost immediately. And if he gets a break, then you're going to be well in the money. But that's a great example of where the downside is really, really small. Um, but the potential for an upset and to trade out at a profit is very high. So just specific on that example, first or second round, um, Rafa or or Novak a dollar one, dollar two on the exchange, and the other player might be twenty dollars or larger. Um, you would just have a, a position pre-play, hoping that they start well, and then you might get out at twelves or something like that. Very much so, and you know you can use little tricks like, as players get older, they tend to pick up more injuries. So if you watch the news wires very, very carefully, you'll be able to see if perhaps they are carrying an injury, and if you're watching the match, you can see what impact that's having. So I remember um, when Stan Varenka won against Rafa Nadal in the Aussie Open, um, the, the thing that we picked up on really, really quickly was um, Nadal's service action was poor. So we figured out he must have a back problem. Um, but we figured that out a long time before the market uh, began to spot what was going on because it took oh, wow. for him to lose a couple of games and then to call on the trainer for people to realize he had a back problem. But we could tell from his service speed that his service action was shot to bits and that he, there must be a problem somewhere.